All right. Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clark. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's, and this is our midweek Bible study. Um, we are in Zechariah. If you want to be turning there, we're going to be in Zechariah 1. We're going to finish up chapter 1, move into chapter 2 this evening. Um, so if you want to be turning there as we continue our study of the minor prophets. Um, way of announcements. Um, women's prayer breakfast this coming Saturday. Calvary Cornerstone. Um, then we're going to continue with our schedule. It's Sunday morning, 9 a.m. for Sunday school. And then at 10 a.m. doing our Sunday morning service. Um, then if you're not comfortable coming inside, we are still utilizing the radio broadcast system. So if you don't feel comfortable coming inside to worship service, but you still want to participate and hear it and all, you can sit in the parking lot and pick it up on 87.9 FM. And then also we post the message out on Facebook when it cooperates. Um, then also remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. Um, then March 27th, which was yesterday, was David Warren's birthday, so we wish him a happy birthday, and we'll get in some details with him on that as well. Um, prayer requests, Marion Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clegg, David Warren. Um, if you haven't seen, David um, was having some problems this morning. Um, they took him to doctors. They found a blockage in his heart, um, so they are going to do some, I guess it's minor surgery, or however they do a stent. Um, that was the last word I got. They're going to try and put a stint in tomorrow. Um, They're looking at possible surgery today, but the last word I got, they were going to try to put a stint in tomorrow. Um, feel that that's a safer um, first option for him. Um, so keep him in your prayers. Um, definitely some issues going on there. Remember um, Matthew, Matthew Ward, Mac McMorrow, Shannon and Daryl Britt, Chloe Akers, Janet House. Janet is just needing special prayer. Um, going through a lot. She's had so, some biopsies done recently, some complications from some of um, them. Um, she's just going through a lot right now. Billy McKenzie, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emmon, Paulette Faison, BJ Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, um, Melody Oakley, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kinlaw, Michael Davis, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson, Cheryl Barker, um, Kathy Beanie, Ronnie King, Barbara Walters, Patricia Clayton, Helen Rogers, Frederica Aswell. Our school systems, I'm sure many of you saw the shooting um, at the um, Christian school. And I was reading that article um, following it. I think this is one of like five shootings at schools within the last two months across the nation. Um, just need to be in prayer for our school systems. Um, the pulpit committee, our church, the lost, our nationalist leaders, troops and their families, um, police officers and then the pastors and their families. Um, continue to remember um, Clara Watson. Um, she's home from the hospital. Last word I got. Um, just still needing some healing touch there. Um, remember the Mississippi storm victims. Um, there's been other victims since as other storms have rolled through. Um, so remember them. I have not heard what they finally ruled the tornado. It doesn't matter the amount of damage it did. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's what they call it. It was disastrous for those people that were affected. So just remember them. Also remember those out west um, as they're dealing with more flooding and more, um, hmm, excuse me, some issues out there from the storms that keep hitting the California coast and up through the mountains. Um, they also had minor earthquakes out there um, this week. So remember them. Um, remember Larry Johnson, his sister passed away as we got word Sunday. Um, also remember the family of Janice Hollingsworth and then Myrtle Holder is in the hospital. Have not had any updates on her. And then also remember Mary Odom. So a lot of different things going on. Um, I'll give it a, it's a praise report. Um, Rachel called me today and Someone somehow got in, got hold of her bank card number and had made some drafts on it. Fortunately, uh, she caught it fairly quickly and they got it stopped. Um, and they were able to get her money back. But like I say, people are looking for opportunities to steal. And somebody obviously somewhere around her saw her use her card and however they got the card number. Who knows with technology today. But like I say, um, but we're blessed that they didn't empty her account and cause her more issues. So like I say... Um, just pr praise for that. 
just continue to, um, to remember our nation, remember this war in Ukraine. Um, tensions continue to rise over into the Far East. Um, like I say, we don't know what's going to come out of that, but hopefully nothing. But um, there's just a lot going on. Also, just remember um, safe travels. Um, a lot of people on the road continue to see a lot of wrecks um, and people get in hurries. So we just need to remember that as well. With that, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we just thank you for many blessings. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless those on our prayer list. And Lord, we just ask for special prayers. Luck has had his surgery today on his shoulder, Lord. And we just pray that you'll heal that shoulder. And we know it's already underway. And Father, be with David. Um, Lord, you know, today was not a good day for him. And he's had some setbacks. And Father, we just pray that they'll be able to do the stint and it'll be successful but lord most of all we know that you're going to provide healing we just pray, pray that you'll remove the blockages and the issues that are creating problems for him lord and that you'll heal him lord and father just be with that family as they've had a very stressful day and a hard day lord and just pray that you'll bless them and father we lift up those on our prayer list we have many who are shut in and lord and we just pray for their blessings upon them and healings and strengthen their bodies we know they'd rather be with us than where they're at and lord we just know that you can bring them comfort in their time of need and father just pray that you'll bless them and father we also lift up those on our prayer list that are going through cancer um, we have several that are going through either chemo or radiation or one type of treatment or another father we just pray that you'll just bless them and Father, it's not an easy disease. And Father, we also have those who are fighting with diabetes and heart conditions and circulatory issues and breathing issues. It, the list just goes on and on. And Father, we know that each and every one of them you love and that you're care for them. We just pray your healing upon them, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you to be with those families and members of our church, Lord, that are battling decisions. Or going through times where we're trying to how to make the right decisions, to make the right choices and all to do your will and do what's best for their families as you're guiding them through them, Lord. And Father, just pray that you'll open up the doors and guide them through the right doors and the things that need to happen as they make the decisions for their families. And Father, we bless them and keep them. And Father, I just thank you for the blessings that you've poured out upon my family in many ways. And Father, you continue to bless us. And Father, we thank you for that. And Father, we just ask that you'll be with those who have upcoming tests and procedures coming up. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless them as they go through those things. God, and direct them. And Lord, as the Easter holidays are coming upon us, help us to remember the significance of it. absolutely the most important holiday that we recognize as Christians. Christmas has its glamour and all the hoopla around it but lord it's easter the resurrect the death and resurrection of your son jesus christ the salvation that's been provided on that cross father we just pray that we'll recognize it and that we'll proclaim it and that we'll help others to recognize the meaning of easter it's not eggs and candy it's a risen savior and father we just pray that you'll bless us and the things that we do and help us to tell others lord guide us and direct us through this time Father, be with our church and all the churches, and Lord, and put a burden upon the hearts of the Christians, Lord, for those names, as I've asked them to write down the names of their loved ones on Sunday, and Lord, we just pray that you'll put a burden upon their heart to reach out to those individuals, to touch them, Lord, to tell them about Jesus. For as many in our lives that we love and care about that don't know you, and Father, we just pray that you'll embolden us and bless us and burden us for those individuals that they may come to know Jesus and father we just ask you bless our nation Lord there's a great healing upon it and father we just pray that people will turn to Jesus and that you'll convict their hearts and that void that they're filling that they'll realize there's not drugs alcohol or anything else in this world that can fill that void except your son Jesus Christ Lord and just pray to burden them with that and show them the way and use us as Christians and others individuals and in your ways to touch them and Lord, we ask 
We ask a blessing upon our schools and our school system. Be with those families, Lord. They have lost their loved ones. And all his children were killed this week in a needless violence of shooting at a school. And it's not the first time. It's just, it seems like a series, one after another, across our nation. Lord, we just pray for peace. And we pray that people will quit killing the children. And that they'll quit returning to violence for the solution to their problems. And Father, we pray. We pray for our police officers, our first responders. Lord, watch over and keep them in all that they do. And as they serve others, Lord, bless them and keep them. And Father, we pray for our military that serves home and abroad. to Keep them safe, Lord. And wherever they travel, bring them home safe. Bring them home whole and complete to their families. It's a tragedy that we've seen so many young men and women hurt by war and side effects of war and being near dangerous situations where they become injured. Lord, just pray to bless them. And Father, we just ask that you'll keep our country safe, but Lord, that you'll bring peace to this world as war rages on around it. And Father, we ask to protect those who are out working on the highways and all the construction that's in our local area. And Father, give them safe work. And also for those that travel those roads, give them traveling mercies that they'll be safe, Lord, as many of us travel these roads in and around these construction areas. And Father, we just pray that everyone is safe. And Father, bless this Bible study. Use it to reach lives of individuals as they hear your word. Let your word speak for itself, Lord. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Let's turn our Bibles. Um, turn to Zechariah chapter 1. As I told you, we're going to continue with our Bible study in Zechariah. Um, we're going to finish up chapter 1, get on through down through part of chapter 2. Remember, Zechariah is the young prophet or minister of the Lord. It's following up right at the last part of Haggai. They kind of teamed up for a little bit. Um, and then, you know, they'll kind of, as Haggai goes his way, Zechariah has his mission. And if you remember right, Zechariah's first message was a call for repentance. That's not an easy first message. And now, you know, we're going to go through a series of visions and we're going to see some of those um, visions this evening in the message that Zechariah has for the people. And we have to look at them and also look at us today and realize the impact it has on us in some ways so in Zechariah 1 18 through 21 it says then lifted I up mine eyes and saw and behold four horns and I said unto the angel that talked with me what be these and he answered these are horns which have scattered Judah Israel and Jerusalem and the Lord showed me four carpenters then said I, what come these to do? And he said, and he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. Now, understand some history, and then we're going to see symbolism there. So we're going to have some of that this evening, too, is, you know, similar to what we were doing with our Bible studies when we were in Revelations. <clears throat> Over the centuries, um, the Jews have suffered greatly at many nations. I mean, just think about, go back, you know, one after another. The early days, um, in the earlier part of it, remember we had raids from the Philistines, the Moabites, the, you know, all these different, and all. So, you know, but remember what God said uh, to Abraham. And this is a promise I think a lot of times we say, oh, that was back then. This don't apply to I firmly believe that it still applies today. As long as Israel is a nation, they're God's chosen people. Um, they're those that call on him, I believe this promise to Abraham is going to hold. It says, I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. That's in Genesis 12 and 3. I believe that's a promise that God's never taken back from Israel for those who follow him, his chosen people. So in this, that the message of the second vision is given Zechariah, the nations that have scattered the Jews is who we're talking about. Um, they need to be afraid. You say, why? But God's been using them to you know, discipline Israel and all that. Um, but they need to be terrified 
uh, of the judgment. Going back to the days of President Ronald Reagan, um, remember at that time, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, he wrote a letter to um, President Reagan, or a note, however, you know, the presidents and them correspond, they refer to it as a letter. And it says, My generation, dear Ron, swore on the altar of God that whoever proclaims the intent of destroying the Jewish state or the Jewish people, or both, seals his fate. Now, what's wrong with that statement? The statement was coming from a man who said he was going to carry out and was going to carry out that judgment. Did he give credit to God anywhere in this? Absolutely not. He was taking it in. And Menachem Begin had that attitude about him. If you strike us, we're going to strike you back twice as hard. I mean, that was his policy. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu, similar type of attitude and all. And it's worked in a lot of ways, especially when dealing with terrorists and all. They didn't threaten the individual little guys that are terrorists. They said, you know, they're going to cut off the head of the snake. And, you know, they, that was one of the things. I think it was Yasser Arafat. That was one of the, the promises they made him. The next person you kill on our side, you're the next one on that side. I mean, that's just sort of the way the policy is because so many people have come after him. But the sad thing of it is they've been trying to fight their own battles. And that's not their place. Um, the Lord does the judging, not the armies of Israel, not man. And, all, and God's judgments are never wrong, but man can mess up. So if Israel would get back to following God, what difference would it make? They wouldn't be making these claims that we're going to do this. And all, the, and all they would be saying our Lord is going to take care of it. So... Getting back to the scripture, the prophecy, the scripture, a horn, remember, going back to our prophecy studies, is a symbol of power, especially a power of a nation. A lot of times it may, re you know, represent a powerful nation, you know, the horn of, you know, Babylon or the horn of Syria or whatever. Um, and, or it can point to a, a ruler. Then there's the, what they refer to as the smiths or the artisans. They also represent nations. Now, depending on where you're at and how God is using you, depending on whether you're a horn of power or whether you're a smith. Um, and in this case, the smiths that God's going to use to defeat the enemy of the Jews. Remember that he used enemies of the Jews to punish them for their sins and their fallen way and following idols and all these different things. So there's times that nations were used and they would at that time been considered a horn and all power that was executed you know, upon Israel or the Jews. When God sends another nation to discipline that nation or remove that nation, that nation is in, in looked at as part of a horn of power, but is looked upon as a smith, one who is destroying the horn that come before him. So it's kind of an interesting flip back and forth. You can be a, a horn conquering Israel one time, and then the next time you may be, you know, a smith, you know, conquering somebody else or vice versa. It's interesting how this works. But that's what it's talking about here. So the concept of four horns is nations, and that reminds us back to Daniel's vision of the image of the beast, both of which speak of four empires. Now, who's the four empires? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. In 722, Assyria devastated the northern kingdom of Israel. We remember that. We've talked about that in prophecy several times. They didn't take Jerusalem, but they got the northern kingdom. Now, what happens after that? And then eventually, um, Babylon came in and oppressed the Jews. But who did they push out? They pushed out the Assyrians. Babylon was a smith in wiping out or pushing away the Assyrians, but they were also a horn of power in oppressing the Jews. And then God raised up who? He raised up Cyrus of the Medes and Persians to go in and conquer Babylon in 539. So Cyrus became what? A smith but he also had power over the Jews so in that sense he was a horn of power and but he allowed the Jews to return to the land God used him to help them return remember that's how we got to the point of rebuilding the, the you know temple and the different things that we've been studying recently then what um, happened after that the Greeks came in and conquered um, 
the Persians under Alexander the Great, and then Greece was conquered by who? Romans. But the main thing, and a lot of people don't realize that there was a very significant point that had to happen with Greece. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention this as a side note. The Greeks, when they came in and conquered the land, they demanded a common language. Think about that. What is important about this? They weren't going to take and have all these interpreters learn all these different languages. When they came in and conquered the land, they demanded the people learn the language as part under Alexander the Great. In doing that, the whole area of Israel and the nations around them all learned to speak Greek. So most people were bilingual or trilingual or whatever. They not only spoke their own language, but they also learned to speak Greek. In the case of the Jews, they speak Hebrew and Greek. What did this allow? Well, when the Romans came in and conquered and all, the Greek language was still embedded. They didn't try to get rid of it. We don't speak Roman. The Romans don't speak it. You know, Greek was the common language. So when the church was scattered throughout Southern Asia, guess what? They all had a common language. The church could explode in a great because there was a common language of Greek that was still being spoken by the different people from different areas because that all those areas had been conquered by the Greeks. So this was a major point of how the church spread early on out of Jerusalem into the surrounding countries. So I'll give you that as a side note. Now, as I said, the horns become the smith. Each empire that conquers, you know, is a smith to the one that they conquer, but they become the oppressor and they're the horn. But it also reminds us of Jews, of, of, of the Jews, of the it reminds the Jews of God's providential care. You know, he pr promised there would be protection in the future. He will not permit any nation to fully annihilate Israel. He lets them go so far to punish them for their Baal worship, their, their adultery, as, as it's referred to in Scripture so much. But he never lets them wipe them off. So then... In the last days, what's going to happen is the Antichrist is going to come on and the ter terrible beast and all, and he's going to establish his kingdom. We talked about that back in Daniel. Um, we studied that. And he's going to persecute the Jews. But guess what? He and his kingdom also is going to be destroyed by the return of Jesus Christ in glory. So each time you see someone rise up and go after the Jews, you'll see a fall after that. Hitler used the Jews as a scapegoat and was very good at it and just killed millions of them, along with millions of other people. We recognize the Holocaust, but he also killed millions of Polish people. And what we don't read about and what's not brought up to light is also millions of people who had disabilities. He saw them as weak. So the mentally handicapped and those that he classified as weak, he also destroyed because he wanted to have a most powerful race. So he also persecuted other people beyond the Jews, but the Jews were the scapegoat. What happened to him in the ultimate? He was eventually destroyed. So it's often hard for us, you know, to look forward because we see all these things happening in the world. But here, think about God's people. They're in Jerusalem. They're trying to rebuild the temple. Things aren't going well. It's been hard. And God's trying to calm back so they'll, they'll do well and he can protect them and prosper them and all. And they can see all these nations around them that still don't want them there. They were against them and they were taking opportunity you know, speaking against them that we've seen in other prophets and all. And so it's hard. So Zechariah is giving these visions. And so again, it says, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, I lift up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. Now, the commentary puts it this way. If you saw a stranger in your house begin to measure the windows for curtains and floor and carpet, you'd probably tell him to leave. You know, it's like, what are you doing in my house? This is my house. You know, I'll measure if I want to buy something. Else. And all. 
But what this is giving us is nobody's going to come in and measure for new furnishings or whatever else unless they own the place. And it says, what well, he's measuring Jerusalem, the breadth and the width thereof. So he is the one who has authority, not coming in to conquer it. He is the one who has the authority over it. So this is the angel of the Lord, which is also what is most believed is a Christophany or the Messiah visiting prior to his actual birth as a babe. So this is Jesus measuring Jerusalem because it's his city that's what the vision is showing us it is his city and it is under his care under his protection and all and he's going to declare and that he's going to complete his works that he has for that city he's going to complete the plan for them this is their future this is the assurance of their future continuing on with this Verses 4 and 5, And he said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say, the Lord will be under her a wall fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Again, here's some symbolism. He declares something else. Not only is Jerusalem going to continue, but the future of it is going to be great because it is going to expand the glory and all to a point that it's never experienced. So it's going to go outside of the walls. It's going to spill over because there's going to be such an explosion of people. And then he says, matter of fact, you're not even going to need the walls. Just because you got a bunch of people don't mean you don't need the walls for protection from your enemies. Why don't they need the walls in this case? Because God will be the wall fire around them. You know, imagine you have a wall and it's all brick and mason, you know, and they can hammer it and break holes in it. But the wall of fire from God, you may throw something out, but it ain't going to destroy it. That fire is still going to be there. And most likely, wherever you throw at it, it's going to be incinerated under the heat and the fire from God. So God's going to provide a wall of fire around his people because they are his, excuse me, his people, and he's going to keep them that way. And he wants to be, and he's going to be honored by it. And, and all. So then, it continues, verses 6 through 9. It says, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he hath touched you, toucheth you, toucheth the apple of my eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. What's he doing here? He's trying to get the message out. And what God is doing, he's admonishing for the Jews that are still in Babylon, that didn't come back. Why would you stay with your oppressor instead of joining the remnant in Jerusalem? Why they remained in the comfort and what they knew in the security of a pagan society. They stayed with what they had. Safe and secure, thinking all will be okay. It's going to continue on. We can handle this. This is okay. They've actually been able to set up and, and live. They were just in a pagan nation under a pagan rule. But God is saying, no, you need to be in your land. You don't need to stay in their land. You need to come home. And they are desperately needed in their own land. There need to be more workers, more people in Israel. And the day that would come that when Babylon, which is under Persian rule, would be judged for her sins. And Babylon, like I say, one night Persians overtook them. But then the Persian Empire is going to be judged by who? The Greeks are going to come in. And so they're going to, Alexander the Great's going to come through. So what's going to happen to the Jews that stayed in Babylon? Well, their good times ain't going to last that long because who's coming in? Another conqueror. Who's going to conquer them? And is he going to know them or care about them? No. He's going to look up upon them like Babylonian trash. Or, in this case, Persian trash. You know, whatever it is. So God's saying, get out of Babylon. Go back home. I've opened the door for you. That's what happened under Cyrus. They could return, but many didn't. And so, 
you know, different things had to happen here. Now, there are certain things that what's not implied is that the Jews who remained in Babylon was were out of the will of God, just as God sent Joseph to Egypt to prepare way for a family. He also had people like Esther and Mordecai and Daniel, his friends, and Nehemiah and his places of pagan, authority and paganism. They do the work and he planned for them to do. But the Lord was summoning the Jews to put comfort and all that away and come to do God's work in the sacred city. He's wanting them to come home. He's doing everything he can to prepare the way for them to come home and they're not. But they are a very precious people. He calls them what? The apple of his eye. And all. It, they're very important to him and he handles them like something that is very delicate. Protecting and keeping them. Now, the Messiah is still speaking. He says he, meaning God the Father, sent me after glory to bring him glory. And all the whole purpose of this, you know, step back and we have to look at this. We understand what's going on there. They're, they need to go home. God's saying, hey, leave Babylon, go home. But if we go back and we look at New Testament and all, because it says what? You know, there that was I, and they're to bring God glory. Well, guess what? The purpose of Christ's life when he came on earth, his ministry, his death and resurrection, was to do what? To bring glory to God. What is part our purpose today? We are to do all things to God's glory. We're not supposed to do it to make ourselves look good. The things that we do should make God look good to be his glory. And, all. and part of the whole purpose of the things that have to happen in Israel is the fact that Jerusalem and Israel has to be restored for what? The glory of God. And that all involves a future restoration. Now, right now, you say, well, Jerusalem's still there. Israel's still there. But is it the nation God has for the end times? Is it a nation that is following him, worshiping him? Absolutely not. There are those who do. But as a whole, the nation is not following God. There are people that are spread out among various different religions, if and to some that don't have any religion at all. There's a great deal of Jews who are atheists. So it doesn't help. So, But God, at the end times, this city is going to be the city, and it's going to bring glory to him. So it's going to have to be reshaped, so to speak, from the inside out, from the people. Their hearts are going to have to get right in order to be the, the city that he wants them to be. But also in this, when they make this adjustment, and they're the city that God wants them to be, God will be able to unveil his future restoration of Israel even further. So, now, let's continue verses 10 through 13. This whole thing takes through. And it says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in a holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Excuse me there. When we hear stuff like this, it ought to make us sing and rejoice, especially the Jews. Because their Messiah is going to come and dwell with them. They haven't recognized him as his first coming as the babe. And now here is the, the conquering of Messiah, the one that they really want. And he's going to come down and he's going to live with them and dwell with them. Just as God had lived in the temple and the tabernacles um, at the time before he removed himself from that, when the people abandoned him, so will the Messiah live among his people. Ezekiel describes the new city and temple if you go back and read through Ezekiel 40 through 48. And he names it at all. And refers to it as the glorious new city. Jehovah Shammah. Which means the Lord is there. That is a pretty powerful name. And one that we haven't heard much. Um, probably many Christians have never heard of. Jehovah Shammah. 
because one of the things about the King James Bible, a lot of times rather than showing them the names of it, they show the translation in many places. But it says, what? The Lord is there, a glorious new city. Think about us as Christians. Where is Jesus? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the Spirit of God? Within us. And so we could literally say that we are Jehovah Shammah, for the Lord is there. He is within us. He is there and lives in and through us if we allow him and we don't hold him back. So in this day, this new Jerusalem, this Jehovah Shammah, many Gentiles will trust the Lord and be joined with Israel. Israel has never been a nation that's exclusively Jews in a whole. Even when they came out of Egypt, certain other nations came with them, or, or people of other nations came with them, and they became pros I'm trying to say that, proselytes, I believe that's the proper word, of the Jewish faith. And there's people today from other nations who have taken on the Jewish faith and all, and attached themselves to Israel, even though they're not Jewish. And so in that, we're hearing that's going to happen here. Now, in Zechariah 2.12, it is the only place in Scripture where Palestine, and we hear that term today in referring of a lot of things in the Middle East, right? But it's the only place where it's called the Holy Land. But yet we use that designation very often, but it is only here that it's used. But it really doesn't apply. Why doesn't it apply? Think about this. Why doesn't it apply? Because the land can't be holy until when? The Messiah cleanses the people in the land when he returns to reign. And we'll talk about that later on over in chapter 3 with other descriptions and things. But think about it. When Moses approached the burning bush, he says, you know, remove the shoes, you're on holy land. And we, you know, we kind of laugh at that. You know, what made hope? Well, the presence of God was there. That was God's spot. That was God. So the presence of God was there. So yeah, he was in the presence of holy. And the light shone forth. And so all that it shone upon was holy. Now what we're talking about is that Israel, Jerusalem, the land of it will become holy. Because why? Jesus is there. And we forget that sometimes. We don't realize he has to be there. We are holy people. If we follow God and trust him now because God is within us. So God is within us. Now, the other thing is, when these things start happening, um, the other nations of the world will give pause, as they say, or consider an awesome silence, as depending on which translation you're reading or commentaries. But the question is why? Because before the Messiah comes to reign, he will judge the nations of the earth called um, the time of Jacob's trouble. And we've talked about that in the day of the Lord. And you can go back through Joel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Revelation. So there's all kinds of cross references that refer to these different things. And, you know, the great tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, we've talked about that. And all this time that is going on, it's going to be a time of great suffering, um, a time of great loss in a lot of ways for people because they're going to measure a little loss in material goods, not spiritual. Many will lose lives or family members or friends of fam friends or whatever, so there'll be some human life loss. There's all kinds of things that happen during the Great Tribulation. But all the suffering and all, and then the nations will receive a sentence for their inhumanity and their ungodliness. When the Lord has roused himself from his holy dwelling, which is Zechariah 2.13, the nations of the world will experience divine wrath. And there will be no escape. If you fall within the spectrum of God's eye and he says you are under his wrath, you will not escape. I don't care how quickly or whatever you do to run and flee from him, you will not escape it. And a lot of people don't understand how there can be no possible escape, but there is none. So now we've talked about three visions, you know, and everything and the two primary ones that we've talked about this evening. And hopefully you're learning from it. Um, 
that God, and many times as I was taught when I was younger, that you know the Old Testament deals with nations and how God interacts with nations, and the New Testament how God interacts with people. But there are sections of it, as we've learned through the studies of the Minor Prophets, where God deals with individuals and helps us get a reflection about things of how they affect us as individuals. Um, but God watches the nations. You know, we talk about a God that watches us, and he does, but he also looks at the nations as a whole and what they are doing. Then God brings judgment upon those nations according to their sins, because nations sin. You say, well, the people sin, They're, the nation is just represent. Well, think about what you're saying. When we as a people decide that certain things are okay as a nation, then we are sinning. That was one of the big things about abortion. And as a nation, we said abortion was okay. And the problem of it is, I was under sin and, and all because I was in a nation that practiced it. And also there was a sin going on around me. And also it was a sin for me as being part of a country who kills innocent babies. I was going to be held responsible for that in part, just like anyone else that's in the nation. Because it's a sin of the nation. And all. So then also there's sins and then there's for the mistreatment of Israel. And there's plenty of nations out there that are going to be judged for their mistreatment of Israel. But out of this also we're going to see that there's a future for Jerusalem and the Jewish nation. And a lot of people say it's past, it's over, it's done. No. Jewish nation is going to continue. And as we move forward we need to protect them. We need to help them. We need to pray for them. Because they have a bright future. It's those who are not Jewish and those who are not saved that do not have a future. So in order to have a future, you're going to attach yourself to Jerusalem or you got to attach yourself to Jesus, which is the best way to have a future so that you can be saved. So with that, um, like I say, one of the things, and I, I've always heard this, and... Um, You know, when we're taught to pray, thy kingdom come, which is in Matthew 6 and 10. Um, for when we pray that prayer, we are praying for peace in Jerusalem. Because where is Jesus going to set up his kingdom? Jerusalem. He's going to set it up in Israel. And like I say, there can be no true peace in Jerusalem. We have all these peace talks and all this stuff in the middle. We see, yeah, I understand that. We're trying to calm it down. But there will never be a true peace in Israel or that region until Jesus Christ sits on the throne in Jerusalem that's when true peace will come so when we pray that or pray or say that thy kingdom come then what we're really saying is for peace to be happening in Jerusalem so with that we're going to stop there and then more um, pick up next time so let's pray our gracious heavenly father Lord we thank you father as we're looking at these visions you know we, we understand these people were in Jerusalem and they're rebuilding the temple. Things are hard. Crops have failed. And God's trying to calm the repentance to turn back. And Zechariah's delivering his message. There's enemies all around them. And so there's being hampered. And, you know, there's raids that go on, as we've learned in other minor prophets and whatnot. And so the people are struggling. And then now you're calling them to, you know, build up this great place to build the temple. And all but for the people to hold on to you and to see that there is a future and that these waves of conquering nations and then the next one conquering don't get in the middle of that get away from it get to where God wants you to be and for today we need to do the same thing we need to be where God wants us to be for those he was telling them leave Babylon and come back to the promised land for God he's saying leave the world and come to me Father, help us to come to you, to hold on to you, to follow you, and to do your will, for there are those among us that need you. Burden our hearts for the lost, and may we pray for them. May we walk to them. May we talk to them. May we witness to them. May we give them our testimony. Whatever it takes to get them to call on Jesus and be saved and to walk into the church, whether it's our church or another one, and find a way to live a life for Jesus. 
Father, use us and guide us. Protect us and keep us. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good night.